Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 155, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Janelle Jaquays. In this part of the interview, we get, we get up to date on her career. We talk about her time as a freelance developer. Uh, then we get into her time at id and what she thinks about the people there, as well as her time at Ensemble Studios and her work on Halo Wars. A lot of great, great stuff, plus all the advice you could ever want about how to get a career in the games industry. It's fantastic stuff, so without further ado, here is Miss Janelle Jakeways. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit, uh, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. talk about uh, 4x4 off-road racing. Okay. You know, I think this is a big a, you know, big move from uh, working on uh, this, these other projects to do uh, this sort of racing game. So, you know, what, well, what, what was that experience like? Four by four off road racing was actually my first um, freelance video game. Um, I had gone, I think I told you, I'd, I'd worked for Coleco and in the, the great collapse of the video game industry. Um, in 1985, my entire team was let go, or what was left of it was let go. And I worked for a small um, hardware toy product product developer for about a year. Um, when I moved on from that job, I went freelance. One of my first clients was a company called, I believe it was called Ogden Micro Design, but they were a design house working with the computer game uh, publisher Epix. So they needed someone to design some products. And I, I did a lot of um, treatments for them one page, hey, here's an idea for a game, here's how it plays, this is what's exciting about it. Would write that up, send it in, they try and sell it. Um, and they want, one of the ones they came to me and said, hey, there's this, um, there was a, an arcade game, it was basically off-road racing. Um, you were in a dune buggy, or maybe it's even called dune buggy. I think my original, <clears throat> my original design spec was called doom buggy. So it was a racing game, but we wanted a little bit of they wanted a little bit of strategy to it. So I came up with these um, different car types. I wasn't a car buff, um, so I came up with these faux car types and figured out their acceleration and weight and calculated the weight and everything of the supplies and the repairs and wrote a design spec. Well, they ended up using. What they, they basically, what they claim is that they use the design spec as inspiration or theme. So for 20 years, I was credited with the music for the game. <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> so I think when, when I actually um, did name changes recently on IMDB, um, and I'll probably have to pick it up a few other places, I went in and corrected that. <laughs> yes, I saw the theme. I think it's on Moby Games, and mm -hmm. it's like surely they're not talking about the soundtrack. No. So you don't have any four by fours in the in the garage then? No, I did not. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you know, uh, one of the great companies uh, that you worked for, of course, was ID, mm -hmm. uh, working on uh, Quake Two and uh, Quake Three Arena. Now, I'm very curious, how how did you get involved uh, with these guys? Okay. Again, we go back to the role-playing game connection. When I worked at Coleco, I was the director of game design. Um, I was essentially in charge of the whole team that did the design for the games. Um, also put together the art team, the original art team. But in, I think it was 82, 83, before the crash, we were trying to fill out a few roles in our design team. Uh, We've had some departures and we're trying to bring in some new talent. We'd mostly been hiring from the role play game community. Designer that I knew was Sandy Peterson. He was working on a, a role playing game that he was famous for, it was called Call of Cthulhu. Um, most of the guys knew him, they'd play some of his games. So we brought him in for an interview. He interviewed and then wisely decided not to take the job because within the next year, we started letting people go. Fast forward, that was 1983, 84. Fast forward to 1997. 
I had just spent some time down in Florida vacationing at Disney World. I was an artist at TSR at the time. I'd taken my family down there and gotten the idea in my head, wow, it's warm down here in the winter. It would be really nice to work in the South in the winter. So about a month later, I was at a game convention for the role-playing game RuneQuest. One of the other guests was Sandy Peterson. We reintroduced ourselves. It had been a while since we'd seen each other, communicated. And he proceeded to buy me lunch and over lunch, sell me on working for id Software. The pitch was, is that John Romero had recently left the company and that I would be replacing uh, John as the next uh, designer. Apparently, Sandy was fairly impressed with my art skills, and we, he thought the company actually thought that bringing in a designer who was also an artist might fill in some gaps that they were missing in their design team. So I said, Sandy, I'm in, you know, I checked with my family. We'll be okay to relocate to Texas. Uh, TSR at the time um, was having some problems. We'd already had one layoff. I'd survived it. Just I'm going to say just barely, but I survived it. Um, interviewed with it. I took a week off. I went down to Mesquite, Texas, stayed with Sandy Peterson at his home, went into work with him, and for a week I learned how to build 3D game levels in Sandy's office. At the end of the week they evaluated my work, said thank you very much, sent me home. The next Monday I got a call from id and they said we'd like to hire you. When can you start? We dickered salary for a little bit, um, came to satisfactory. We dickered starting time. Um, they moved. They asked me to move up what I was comfortable with. So I was down there two weeks later. Um, my family was back in Wisconsin, but I was working at a desk at id Software. And that was March 1997. Did you like it there? I mean, was there a lot of drama uh, left in the air with uh, Romero's departure? It was pretty much known for their drama. Um, there wasn't as much. I mean, they had a tendency to not be real happy with people who used to work there. I'll just leave it at that. And there were a number of people who used to work there at that time already. Yeah, it must have been a tumultuous uh, time, but I guess you know they, they obviously uh, survived it. I remember I had Romero on you know, it's been a while a while back, but he was, you know, he said he was disappointed with, with Quake, you know, on that line. I was wondering, uh, what, what do you think about it? Quake? Or just, the, you know, the Quake series. Um, as I understand it, the first Quake, they, uh, they didn't do what they, they didn't do what they had thought they were going to do as far as the game was concerned. What was really radical about it was the graphics. That was really one of the first true, you know, it was the first true 3D shooter. Um, although, I, no, I think there was actually one before it that may have had that claim. Um, something from Bethesda. It was a 3D shooter. It was very fast action. Um, but that's what it really ended up being remembered for, was that fast action deathmatch game. And that kind of carried through that every game thereafter, they started making the same game over and over. If you look at Wolfenstein, Doom, you know, they established the genre for what 3D action shooters were, but year after year, product after product, they kept making the same product, which is a little faster, definitely a lot better graphics every time, um, but the same product over and over and over again. And usually they would end up crunching their way through it and get down to the end and, oh my God, we need an end game. And they wouldn't have much to show. Well, you made another uh, big transition about, you know, after that, right? Moving into uh, Age of Empires uh -huh. uh, 3, which, you know, of course, re really good real-time strategy game. This is one of my, my favorites. I actually have uh, the, the War Chiefs uh, sitting right over there. Ooh. Uh, so, uh, you know, what was, you know, how did this, uh, how did you get involved uh, with this project? Okay. Yeah, about five years after I started it, it really felt like it was time to leave. 
So I started looking around for other work, applying around, um, checking out my contacts in the industry. And I had an artist friend, again, from the role-playing game days, who was working at Ensemble. I'd actually connected him with the people there, and they eventually hired him as one of their marketing artists. Sandy Peterson also worked there. And when the two of them found that I was looking, they jump-started me coming in to interview. I spent, took two days off from work, literally, and interviewed with everyone at Ensemble Studios in 19, who was at Ensemble in 2002. To get into Ensemble then, you had to get a unanimous vote from everyone in, in on the project team. The whole studio had to say, yes, we want this person to work with us. And that's how it would be for several years. Um, so I interviewed there in February, and it was literally almost five years to the day that I started it that I wrote my last uh, plan file and said, it's been fun, and left. So when I actually went to work for Ensemble, I was not on the age projects. I worked on a second, I worked on what was called the second team. Um, we were trying to come up with new product ideas and they had gone through quite a number. In fact, the project that they were working on when I interviewed, I had no idea what it was, but by the time I came there, they'd already decided not to do it and that we're on to another one. In fact, our first project that I worked on was a platformer, not a strategy <laughs> game. Wow. We worked on that for about a year. Um, kind what of got the, name the of sense. platformer, do you remember? Pardon? Do you remember what the uh, platformer was? Um, we didn't, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It never came out, of course. Um, but it was the idea that we had come up with uh, the three designers on the project. Uh, myself, Sandy, and Tim Dean, we came up with an idea that we were on a generations ship. If you understand, you know, it's a mm -hmm. science fiction concept of a spaceship that's sent into space with people and animals on board, and they go through generations of people to get to their de destination. Well, we came up with an idea where a ship that had the people and the animals on it and it kind of malfunctioned and it had been a long time and the animals started mutating into bipeds, um, developing their own societies. So we had some really awesome uh, creatures that were like bipedal rhinoceri and uh, monkey shaman. Um, we had some really fantastic concept artists on the team who just, they just brought these guys to life. We we're actually able to model a few of them before the project shut down and they captured exactly that craziness of the, the concept art. But as we got through it, we got the sense it was, um, it might have been Ed Freeze was the, the director at the time, wasn't interested in that product. So we moved on to another one, which was a driving game. Um, worked on that for a year. And around that time, I started getting bored with working on projects that were going nowhere with the company. So that was two years in for me. And I asked to be transferred to another team. That team was the Age of Empires three team. Um, Age of Mythology had been produced in my first year there and the expansion pack. While I didn't work on those other than as a play tester, I do have play test credits in them. Age of Mythology, Age of Empires came out, three came along. And when I asked to transfer, I asked to transfer to the art team. So I went from being a content designer on the uh, second team, the R&D team, to being a 3D artist and um, general artist on Age of Empires 3. So I'm sort of curious why you would ask to, uh, you know, to uh, be that, uh, to uh, switch into art again. Could be a character flaw. Um, I get bored doing one thing for any length of long length of time. And I was ready at that point, the, the opportunities in 3D art were more entertaining to me. And it just seemed like there was, there was more options to do things that interested me. And the truth was it for, for working on the next three projects that I worked on, that was exactly true. Um, I, I did um, 3D art for Age of Empires 3. Um, if you're familiar with the game at all, 
Well, and I've played them. I mean, it's been a while, you know, but I didn't well, play all the way through. There was the concept of the home cities, which were basically these grandiose 3D user interfaces where you went and you picked out your next uh, cards or powers. Yeah, that I, you yeah I love that part. Yeah. Okay. I did about half of those. Um, my office mate did the other half, and there were a couple other guys who threw in, but those were our babies. We we ran those from start. Once once we got rolling on the project, we did all the art, all the buildings, all the designs, put everything together, uh, construction, just set them up so they ran. And the fun part was going in at the end and being able to add in little personalizations to the store signs and the uh, different establishments to say to either include the names of family and friends or coworkers who you know they're little easter eggs for everyone well, let's move uh, forward a little bit more than to uh, halo wars okay you know and i got a very specific question i wanted to ask about this because i know that you uh, worked on the multiplayer uh you know, maps. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I started to think about, you know, what would be involved in working on a, a big multiplayer map? You know, what, you know, so what are the, uh, the challenges of doing uh, something like that? And what have, what have you, uh, what's your advice or what's your uh, strategy for doing that really well? Well, they were actually, um, they were joint projects in the sense that I ended up being the artist who finished the design. What I would get from design, um, the content designers, was a very simple 2D layout, literally sketched out in our editing tool, where they would come in, flatten out these areas, um, suggest that this was this type of terrain, not even suggest terrain, just here. We want these to be paths. We want to place our buildings and landing sites here, and the special features go here. And I would go, well, do you have any idea what you were thinking of for terrain when you were asking this? No. They were just giving me basically flat boards. So I would work with our uh, environment art lead and our um, art director on the project or our producer. And we'd figure out, well, okay, for the product, what environment do we need? What what are we missing? Where do we what where do, what direction do we need to do we need the ice world? Do we need the green world? Do we need the um, where the uh, the flood live? And we would produce a map with the ge the geography in it that matched that world, and staying true to the, the layout and design of the designer, so it his map, our visuals, and. We would go through that back and forth. Okay, you know, the designer would come in and say, wow, this really needs to be flattened out here. And he would come in and literally bulldoze an area. Just whatever was there, flatten it out, raise it up, back to ugly. Art would, you know, it would go through play test again and come back to the artist. And the artist would fix it and make it beautiful again. And we went through that for a number of years, or I say, yeah, a number of years, actually, a number of rounds, go rounds. Um, and we ended up being gated, not by how fast the artists could work, but by getting playable maps from the designers. Yeah, I remember reading uh, somewhere about Marvel Comics and the way that their writers and artists kind of work together to, you know, sort of collaborate to create the, uh, the comic books. But, you know, it seems like a lot of the uh, game artists I talked to, it sounds like a very... Uh, disjointed process and there's not a lot of uh, you know it's not as as fruitful as it could be uh, that's true a lot of um, a lot of the designers from that time period didn't come from a collaborative background um, it was design did the work it was kind of a waterfall approach that design would do their work they get it all done and they pass it off to art um, the artist literally then became hands the hands finished what the designers work. Uh, if it what didn't get, you know, if it didn't match what they liked, we'd start over and do it all again. It kind of, um, I won't say it got old, but it, uh, the psych, there was a tendency to repeat the cycle to a completed state 
and then fix it. So if you were in charge of a studio, how would you want to uh, set things up to avoid that? Oh, everybody works together from the first. Um, I actually did have a, I have never run a studio, but I did have a sort of a say in how an ideal studio might be set up. And that was uh, when we set up the guild hall, uh, the uh, guild hall at SMU, it was a collaborative approach from the first. So you had designers, coders, and artists all working together to make their projects. So they were all talking together from the first. They knew artists and designers would know what, what code limitations or special powers they had to work with. Um, just programmers had to learn how to work with creative people. Designers, your level designers, um, generally had to learn how to negotiate between the two. So having people work all together you know, on the project at the same time is the solution. Well, talking uh, about the Guild Hall, a lot of people that uh, watch the show want to make games or want to get involved in the industry. And I was, uh, you know, thinking about art and design. Uh, I mean, you're one of the rare people that has done both, right? Is that something you would recommend or do you think people should focus on one or the other? It really depends on what you're good at um, and your passions and you know, in some place, you know, your character flaws. I tended to find that I would get bored doing any particular project for a long time. So I would work back and forth between art and design. So it was very frustrating when I've gotten into situations where I'd get laned into one or the other, which is pretty much the way most larger studios work. They have to work comp compartmentalized. You can't serve two masters particularly if you have deadlines in both. Smaller studios can do that, or I should say very small studios can do that because at that point, everybody's trying to make every contribution they can. And you see the same thing. Um, one of the level design students going through Guild Hall uh, with my son at the time, back in the second group going through, good level designer, great audio designer. Um, in fact, a number he currently now he works in the industry doing audio not level design same thing um you have people who are good at two or two or three skills they generally will specialize in one and just kind of backfill with the other if there's time or if they need if needed um it's very difficult to find people who go through uh, or who are, it's very difficult to find places you can work where you can be a, multi, a polymath, do everything. They tend to be your own studio. So, you know, what do you, what do you say to the, I'm thinking 15, maybe 16, a 17 year old uh, kid who, his dream is to be part of the industry and just wants to be where you are as, as a life ambition. Now, what could that kid be doing right now uh, to be preparing for their career? Um, one, stay in school. Uh, that's the first thing. Study. Find out where your passions are um, and do something about it while you're still in school. If you love art, find ways to do art, to get involved in art projects while you're in school. If you love coding, you may need to self-teach how you're, yourself going through doing um, coding projects. Level design, there's the tools are out there to do it. This, the uh, the UDK uh, Unreal Development Kit, it's an amazing tool set that, that's available to learn how to do it, to bootstrap yourself. It'll get you a leg up. Um, so it's to develop your own skills and passions while you're young. Have that be your hobby, not the playing of the games. In fact, what I would say is I think one of the things I found through my entire career was that I really love making the product even more than playing it. Um, that, that's the, the reaction that I get from watching people play from, and enjoying what I've done, whether it's role play games or video games or artwork. That's what has motivated me through my career. To find a passion like that when you're young, to understand that I'm going to grow up to be an entertainer I'm going to use some tools, some skills to achieve that, but getting the value out of making other people happy. 
Then when you get to the point where you're in college, if you want to be a, a level designer, just study things you enjoy. Study everything. Um, do well. Be a good student. Don't mess around. You know, don't waste your time playing games all the time. Play enough to, you know, to entertain yourself and to break stress. But don't ha don't let that be your college career because game the best thing you're going to get playing games a lot is you may end up as a game tester and that's not necessarily the route into making games and then start take classes that enhance the skills you want to develop if you want to be a game artist become an artist first study art traditional art and then enhance it with video game or with um digital art skills coders will Learn math, learn engineering, learn physics, and writing software. You take these are what you take out into the career field. If you're a good student and you can afford graduate school, that's the path I would recommend. Uh, Guildhall is a very good school for graduate level studies because you're totally focused on making games. One of the downsides of an undergraduate program is you're an undergraduate. You're doing everything. You're taking core classes. You're taking, you know, intro to lit. You're taking phys ed. You're doing all these things, classes that are not making games. And you're doing it over a period of four or five years. It's drawn out. You're not getting the focus. Those are good places to study game development skills, but not to get a game development degree. Um, and then when you're out, make a kick-ass portfolio. Don't make it with student projects, especially if you're an artist. Put your passion, put your heart into what pieces you want to make. Sell what you're good at. Sell yourself. Show that you can do, that you have the passion to do professional level work. Because you're not competing to get into the industry. You're not competing against other students getting, coming out of college. You're competing against guys and girls who have been working in the industry for five or six years. They know their stuff. You need to be able to compete against them not against your student peers. And that's pretty much it. That was beautiful. Well, there is one more thing. And that's get to know people in the game industry. Make personal contacts, however you do it, whether it's going to PAX or especially if you can get out to GDC. Uh, if you want to start through the role play game industry, go to like places like Gen Con or other small cons. Get to know people because people that you know are how you get interviews it's who you know that get, helps you get interviews but once you get there it's what you can do it's what you can show that you can do it gets you the job it still ends up being up to you not who you know and that's it well thanks so much uh, for answering all these questions it's you know i feel like i've grilled you, <laughs> you no, know, no, with no, all, no 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 i'm good with, with this. all this stuff up you know, of course, I wanted you. Uh, you know, want to mention these uh, prints that you have for sale on, on Etsy. Is there any websites uh, that you want to direct people to that are interested in your work? Um, right now, my personal site has been shut down for a while uh, due to recent changes. Um, still going to be bringing that up. The Etsy site's probably the best. Um, I believe it's called. Uh, it's either Laughing Dragon or Laughing Dragon Girl. Um, or search for Red Dragon, or search for Janelle Jakeways. You'll be able to find. I'll be putting some more stuff up there fairly soon. Excellent. Is there anything else that you wanted to, uh, or anything that I didn't cover that you want to cover? Any comments that you want to make? Anything of that sort? Well, um, no. I think you've been fairly uh, fair, covered a lot. Um, I will say that the, I'm very impressed that you have the War Chiefs on your shelf back there. That is actually the project that uh, I've enjoyed working on the most in my career. It was just, a, it was a fun little project. It was a very small team and we did it in 11 months. I was thinking about that, how you, you know, the, uh, the various projects you've worked on, it's been small teams to bigger teams to mm -hmm. you know, bigger, t I guess the Halo Wars team must have been uh, <laughs> huge, right? Well, it ended up being at the end. Um, I think when I was on it originally, it was like 60 people. At the end, it was everybody in Ensemble pitching in. All the other projects have been closed down. Um, and then at a certain point, when Microsoft said, we're going to be shutting your studio down, 
everyone in the studio who had been working on their projects came to work on Halo Wars. And the decision we made at that point was that, well, we can be really depressed about this and just let, let things slip, or we can make the best game possible that's going to embarrass this company for shutting down this studio. And we're pretty convinced we did the latter thing. So what's in your immediate future here? Is there any exciting projects on the horizon? Well, um, working with uh, my current employer, working on uh, uh, <laughs> World of Darkness, um, still continuing to work on that. Um, I'm doing a little bit of work on the side, doing um, illustrations for some retro, retro role-play gaming projects. Um, have been involved in a local convention, not a local, a Texas convention, um, as a regular guest every year, uh, and have made some fun connections through there. And finally, uh, it was just time to start giving back a little bit as far as illustrations go. And I'm looking forward to working on those. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with another of my famous retrospectives. And uh, in case you don't know, the way I select those, I take a list of 20 games that you guys have suggested and uh, put it on a list and then roll my trusty D20 here to determine what game gets retrospected. Uh, so if you would like to suggest a game, you can do so here in the comments. You can do it at Facebook or Twitter, uh, Google+, Armchair Arcade, or you could even email me. Uh, so let me know what games you'd like to see on the show, and I'll uh, put it on the list. Uh, so thank you very much, guys. I also want to thank everyone who has donated and supported the show. It's really easy to do. Just go to armchairarcade.com and uh, pop in to the uh, Match Hat link there at the top right of the page. It takes about five seconds to set up a subscription, but it really, really helps guys, and I deeply, deeply appreciate it. All right, so what about that Ale of the Week? All right, folks, so this week I've got a little something here called Sierra Nevada Southern Harvest, or Southern Hemisphere Harvest Ale. Now, the idea here is if you want the best beer, you have to have hops that were harvested in the fall. Of course, that only happens once a year, you know, if you are limited to the Northern Hemisphere, but you can go to New Zealand and uh, it's fall there when it's spring here. So you can have a Southern Hemisphere harvest. So <laughs> I don't know. I think I've gotten that straight. Um, I'm not sure how much stock I put in that whole uh, theory, but I guess we'll find out. Um, let's see if there's an alcohol percentage here. 6.7%. So, you know, it's, it's up there, but shouldn't be too bad. So anyway, let's get the Southern Hemisphere harvest open and see what it's all about. So I've got the Southern Hemisphere Harvest here in the old drinking horn. It's quite a nice uh, smell to this. It's also quite a foamy, a big head. Uh, so you want to pour very slowly, uh, a lot slower than yours truly did. But the smell is uh, quite nice. It's uh, quite pleasant, not very strong. Uh, so let's give it a taste and see what, see what we get. Well, it's definitely got a strong flavor. What is that flavor, though? That's what I've been trying to, uh, to ascertain here. You know, I have to say, it's, it's, I haven't tasted anything quite like this before. It's kind of, uh, it, it, I, re I recognize it. I seem to remember this flavor from somewhere in the distant past, you know, if you ever felt like that. Kind of almondy, um, maybe a bit of pistachio, uh, kind of a mild apricot. The little hint maybe of like a pine, pine resin. Kind of resiny, you know, I think that's probably a good descriptor for this. Very, very interesting and complex uh, flavors here. I think if, uh, I think I, I think anybody would enjoy this, if, if for no other reason than just the novelty of all the different flavors that are gonna hit you in, in sequence. Uh, quite interesting. Yeah, this is definitely one of the better ales I've tried on the show, so. I'm going to go with a, I think I'll go with a full four out of five on this one. Really uh, good choice, really interesting. It's definitely uh, going to challenge your taste buds. Uh, so uh, check it out, a Southern Hemisphere Harvest Ale. Quite nice. All right, let's uh, finish up with a quotation. And as you might have expected, I uh, chose an artist for this quote. And it goes something like this. I only wish they would take me as I am. Said by Vincent van Gogh. 
See you guys next week. Believe me, Doctor, the place is impregnable. Never cared much for the word impregnable. Sounds a bit too much like unsinkable. What's wrong with unsinkable? Nothing. As the iceberg said to the Titanic. What? Blip, 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 blip.